Well, I'm very grateful and happy to be here, and I appreciate Gerard's invitation to speak on this topic. Um, so what I am going to talk about is conservation, uh, translocations, and why individuals matter to that. And I'm going to eventually focus on um, the, um, the, an endangered species of desert rodent in the U.S., which is, um, I'll get to that in a moment. But first, before I do that, I want to read something to you to get us in the right frame of mind. So I'm going to keep the screen black for this. Throughout its life, an animal invests substantial time and energy learning the details of its home area. It learns where to find food, where predators lurk, and what type of predators there are. It learns where it can find cover and refuge, an animal knows its neighbors and has negotiated relationships. It knows its place in the social group and has learned to keep its position and minimize conflict. And suddenly, an animal is confined to a trap, frustrated and wanting to escape. The trapped animal is approached by what it likely perceives as a predator, certainly as a great threat. It is handled, physically manipulated, and perhaps physically altered only to be then taken out of its home. To where? It could be held captive for some period in an entirely foreign, human-constructed enclosure, where it's monitored, examined by its perceived predator, or perhaps it is immediately released into a seemingly similar, but entirely unfamiliar habitat. The animal is forced to forgo a lifetime of knowledge, much of which it acquired gradually and specifically in its home environment. Without this advantage, stressed and cognitively impaired, the animal ventures out into a dramatically novel and dangerous environment to fend for itself against all odds. So what I've described here, which has been ad I adapted from a paper by a conservation behaviorist, Ron Swaysgood, is the animal's pers perspective as it's taken through the translocation process. Right, so what is translocation? We heard um, um, about reintroductions um, yesterday. So a translocation, right, is an umbrella group under which a uh, reintroduction would, would fit. So they're the deliberate and mediated movement of free-ranging animals. And for this talk, I'm really going to be speaking specifically to uh, moving wild free-ranging animals as opposed to reintroducing captive animals, captive bred animals. So it's a common conservation practice to combat species loss, right? It's probably part of the recovery plans for most, if not all, threatened species worldwide. And there are about at least 700, probably, translocations of various forms happening each year around the world. It's also, so it's a common conservation practice. It's also a very popular practice among stakeholders, right? Because on paper, it seems like everybody is getting something. So certainly, um, developers are um, able to um, get land, able to develop their projects because they can um, say, we're going to take over this land, and you can then, we'll just move these animals to another location. Um, conservation biologists get something out of it in that they think they're conserving species, and even, even animal welfareists think they're getting something out of it because it seems like you're saving lives. So that's how it looks um, on paper. Right, so here are just some images of um, different animals in various stages of, of translocation. So a desert tortoise, a rhinoceros, an orangutan, and um, one of my study species, the Stevens kangaroo rat. So we have during capture, release, um, after release, um, this is um, during habituation. So what do we know about um, translocations? In addition to their definition, that they're common, that they're popular, there are also, as we talked about last night, there's a high failure rate to translocations. So what does that mean? It means about 50 to 95% of the animals die, probably within the first few weeks of release. So what does this mean for our conservation goals then? We're not meeting them. Right, 50 to 95% mortality is pretty much failure. And that's not an uncommon statistic for translocation around the world. So 
This is often the face. So when we hear 50 to 95% mortality, high failure rate, this is the face of that, right? So we have high injury, could be leading to disease. We have extreme stress. So this might be what cognitive impairment looks like, right? That's the face of it. We have stress of capture, and we have a horrible death, right? So this is an, a kangaroo rat that I found during, after the soft release. That's not a, a, the face of an animal that died comfortably or humanely. So what about translocations? So the reason I came to research translocations is that it, it got me thinking about conservation practice, the high failure rate of conservation practice, um, of, bio, of conservation biology and the practice itself. Um, and it, it, made me, it made me question not only the goals, right, of, the, of conservation biology and the practice, but certainly questioning the methodology that we use, right? And, and I think, and, and many others are starting to think this, that the high failure rate that we see is due to conservation biology's strict adherence to the, the focus on the concern of populations, species, overall biodiversity, right? And that comes at a cost, right, of understanding how conservation interventions actually affect individual animals, and it comes at a cost of understanding how individual animals interact with or at the level of species and population. And I, arguably, I think that translocations exemplify this cost greatest because it's in translocations, right, where species survival, population survival, depends directly and demands this direct care and management of individual animals. So just to highlight this a little bit more, right? So historically, right, or how conservation biology came to be, it developed through concerns over the loss of wilderness. Right? And so historically, there has been this focus on health of populations, health of biodiversity, species, et cetera. Right? And there has been a, an implicit and then um, a very explicit exclusion of the welfare of individual animals. Whereas animal welfare science, on the other hand, right, has focused on individual animals under direct human care, right? So it developed from our concern and our treatment over individual animals, but it has focused on companion animals, animals used in food production, in science, entertainment. And so when we talk of wild animals, animal welfare science hasn't really it historically spent a lot of time thinking of them, except for concerns mainly with consumptive activities, right? So hunting and trapping and things like that. So what does this mean for translocation success in today's world, right? Where we have a better understanding of the impact of human activity, and also our conservation interventions have intensified so greatly. So this is where we need conservation biology and animal welfare science coming together to feed into this process. So where we're thinking about, at the same time, the health of species and populations, as well as how individual animals interact with that. Right, so going back to this, right? So the face of this high failure rate, what this means. So I want to now talk about, I'm going to be using Stephen's kangaroo rat as a, a visual example, and I'll talk more specifically about them. But let's think about, so and I mentioned it a little bit in the introduction in that, in that passage that I read. But let's go through, why is this oftentimes, right, the face of translocation, more often than not, right? It's because think about what an animal has to go through, what we put it through in the name of conservation. Right? So, regardless of how well-intentioned we are. So an animal is going to undergo some 
type of capture, right? Some amount of handling and examination, and oftentimes some actual physical modification, whether you're ear clipping, branding, um, tagging in some way. Some amount of and duration of captivity. My animals were in captivity for two weeks to a month. Some animals aren't in captivity at all. It might be a day, it might be months. And then they're released into that novel environment, right? So from our perspective, it looks, we've picked out a location that we think looks good, has all the resources we think these animals might need to them. It's entirely foreign. And then there's some degree um, of monitoring with various levels of invasiveness. So it could be someone sitting in a field watching these animals. It could be that they're, like my kangaroo rats, they have, um, they have uh, radio backpacks on. You could have a pit tag, so abdominal surgery with some animals, et cetera, to monitor them. So conservation biologists and behavioral ecologists have asked some really important um, and very informative questions throughout the, the history of translocation. And a lot of those questions are sort of fall into these four categories. So where will we translocate an animal? What's the right habitat? It could be how we might do it. Do we do a hard release? Or do we do a soft release? When we might do it, what time of year, what time of day, what's the season? It could even be why we translocate. Is this animal threatened? Is this population threatened? Will we see any success if we do this? The one question that conservation biologists and behavioral ecologists, practitioners of translocation biology haven't really asked at all is who we're translocating. Who are these animals that are being translocated? So now I just want to introduce Stevens kangaroo rat a little bit before we talk more about the who. So this is a, a desert rodent. This is the state of California in the US. They have a very small um, historical home range. So this is between, I don't know how many people have visited California, but this is just inland from that, from those cities. So they're a nocturnal species. There are about 20 species within this, this genus. They're nocturnal, they're um, saltatorial, they hop about, they're bipedal. Um, they live in burrows when they're not active above ground. I consider them quasi-solitary, um, as opposed to some other species of, of this genus um, that are way more isolated. These guys are always in auditory and visual contact with other conspecifics. They primarily eat seed, they're considered, although keystone species is a bit of an outdated term in ecology, they're still considered a keystone species in that they actually help maintain a, a, a native perennial grassland that they're associated with. And they've been um, listed as endangered federally since 1988. So these are the three threats to their environment. One is so they're the native grass that they're associated with are these uh, perennial bunch grasses. This is a uh, European oak that has invaded, very dense. They can't um, combat that. Um, agriculture has also displaced them. Uh, a lot of vineyards in Southern California and like most everywhere, um, um, human um, housing development. Okay, so what I was interested in doing was getting at the who of um, who is being translate, uh, translocated. So what I wanted to do was create character profiles, specifically doing um, physio-psychological profiles for these animals. And I looked at uh, stress levels using fecal cortisol um, to do a non-invasive um, way of looking at stress. I also looked at captive behaviors and also assess their personality dimensions um, using a five-factor model that we use um, with humans and has been applied to a whole range of, of animals and other animals, other species. So just very briefly, and if anyone has questions about methodology specifically, we can talk after. But for the personality dimensions, I um, introduced them to two different contexts. So one was a predator simulation, so this is exposing them to um, fox pee. Fox urine. 
And then also, if you can see, it might be pretty dark, but this is a conspecific interaction where they're exposed to a mirror. The other thing I want to bring up is their home environment, because this actually plays a huge part um, in their response to translocation, where we're getting these animals from. So getting at their life history, their experience. So for, I did probably 10 translocations over about five years. I'm talking about one of these translocations during one season. Um, so for this translocation, these animals came from two source populations, one that I'm gonna call parking lot and another probably I'll refer to as El Sol. So parking lot is um, a dirt area. It's over low parking for a um, camping ground. So it's completely, it's, it's kind of shocking that the, there are kangaroo burrows all throughout here. It's probably a sick population. There's no aerial cover, um, but it's highly populated here. And highly disturbed, a lot of um, physical disturbance, auditory disturbance year round. So this is a fallow vineyard um, that I'm calling El Sol. More typical habitat, lots of aerial cover, etc. So looking at the fecal cortisol, so measure a proxy for stress. So here is um, fecal cortisol in nanograms per gram, and then we're looking at what the wild level, so their pre-capture level compared to levels during captivity. And we can see that there is a, a distinct difference. Their, their levels of cortisol rise during captivity. But when we actually break this down and we see what's going on when we compare animals from the two source populations, although for both populations it's still increasing during captivity, when we compare the baseline uh, fecal cortisol, the, those from the parking lot have much higher baseline cortisol than those individuals from El Sol, the fallow vineyard. And then when we look at the captive behavior, so for some of the things that I looked at were resting in their burrows, I'm gonna go a little longer, jumping, digging, feeding, chewing, grooming, seed caching, and, and sand bathing. They have a dorsal gland and they'll rub that along the sand. And so the white, right, is those from the parking lot, that bare area, the, the gray is the El Sol. There's a huge, huge, huge difference in their activity level um, in captivity, okay? So El Sol are way more active across all behaviors than the parking lot individuals. So looking at personality dimensions, I identified three key dimensions of personality in these um, kangaroo rats. So excitability, persistence, assertiveness, assertiveness. These correspond to the three key um, dimensions that we see across taxa, including humans. This is also just a scatter plot of showing, so each circle is an individual. So we've got persistence, excitability, and assertiveness on this graph. And this is just to show you the wide range of personality dimensions um, among this population. So when we break this down and look at these, these two different populations by behaviors. So we see that with exploration, parking lot individuals much, much less exploratory than those from El Sol. With social interaction, those from the parking lot have much higher interest in interacting with conspecifics than those from that fallow vineyard. I'll be done soon. And then with anti-predator behavior, those from the parking lot, right, that with no aerial cover, no experience with that, ha it showed much more, um, a higher level of anti-predator behavior than those from El Sol, the, fa the fallow vineyard. So when we look at a correlation between fecal cortisol and personality, we see that as assertiveness or as boldness increases, we see a decrease in basal fecal cortisol. So how does this translate to survival after translocation? So we see the percentage of animals trapped here and the survival and how that's actually broken down by the, the two source populations. So we see a much higher survival rate with those from the parking lot. Okay, so these are um, less bold individuals with a higher baseline cortisol. 
So what does this mean for our survivor profile? So essentially, who is surviving translocation? So based on my data, it's those that are showing higher levels of docility, right? Those that are more cautious. Those also that have greater social, actually more than interest, social flexibility, right? Thinking about they're interacting with individuals they're not used to, so that they're, they're, they show higher social flexibility. They also are showing greater adrenocortical responsiveness. They can handle the stress better. Let's, I'll be done in a second. So does personality affect coping ability, and can personality predict translocation survival? And the answer for both of these is yes, it can. So with translocation, right, we have opportunistically trapped and artificially assembled um, animals. So what this means for what our conservation goals, we want a population that is diverse in its personality, right? We, because it's op they're opportunistically trapped and artificially assembled, we might be selecting for a particular personality type. And so for the health of that population in the long run, that's problematic. So one of the things we need to do for translocations, in addition to thinking about individuals, is actually modify our methodology so we can accommodate a huge range, the complete range of personality, right? Not just one type based on this problem, but change our methodology so we can accommodate a healthy composition of personality so they have a better chance of surviving and establishing a viable population. Right? So for compassionate conservation, in conservation, for translocations, individuals do matter. They're integral to the success of this practice. I'm almost done. It's my last slide. Right? So we have an increasing understanding of individual animals and their importance in the community they, they live. With every example of, the, of, the, of doing this kind of work, we know individuals are important. Right? Individuals are repositories of social and practical knowledge for their groups, right? And they provide social and behavioral stability. In addition to those important roles, right, the variation among them is hugely important, right? It's important for the health of their communities and ultimately for the survival of the species. That's it. Thank you.